So my talk is called How Not to Write Swift, and we're running super over, so I'll be as fast as I possibly can, jumping right into the easy stuff. Who am I? As you can tell, always on brand, I run a site called Hacking with Swift. Over 1,200 articles on the site, all free of charge. Go and check it out. In January, I released a new course in video form called Swift in 60 Seconds, teaching Swift in videos that are one minute or less, all free online. I run the annual Swift Community Awards. You can vote for the people and projects that helped you most over the year. And just last month, I released a new open source app called Unwrap. It's an interactive way to learn Swift on your phone. I make lots of books, though. That's my full-time job. I am indeed an author. And in fact, everyone here, including the live streamers, go to this URL. In the next few minutes, you can grab a free book, Swift Coding Challenges. <laughs> All my books come with lifetime Swift updates. So shortly, when I get back from NS Spain, I'll be doing a Swift 4.2 update for that, free of charge. Go and get that. Five, four, three, two, one. It's going away. Go on. Right. If you want to get in touch, please do. I am two straws on Twitter. I am two straws on GitHub. On Reddit, I'm two straws. But on Stack Overflow, I am two straws. Remember, the first part will find me or email me. I'm paul at hackingwithswift.com. OK. Today's plan. Now, you should know that all the code we write in our applications ultimately becomes ones and zeros, ons or offs, trues or false, machine code. But the actual code we write is far more nuanced. We make many, many choices every day. And the mark of what I think is a good pragmatic developer is someone who can say, this time, this is the right solution, and this time, this other solution is better. Every project we start, we make choices like storyboards or programmatic UI. Imperative code or functional code? MVC or MVVM or Viper or Clean or whatever is the current thing the cool kids are using. But Swift is not a pragmatic language. Swift is a highly opinionated language. It's the complete opposite, which means for many tasks, there's only one right way of doing things. For example, this is trying to read a string using a character index integer. That does not work. You cannot do that in Swift. Not because it's impossible, but because they just choose not to. This code fixes it just fine. A few lines of a custom subscript, you're done. A Swift team, blink of an eye, could fix that, but they choose not to. Because folks could write code like this, looping over the string letter by letter by letter. And that will be an O-N, an order N operation. It's very, very slow, and they won't understand why. They'll just blame Swift. Now, believe it or not, I am not a highly opinionated developer. I'm quite relaxed and I'm quite pragmatic. But if I stood here for 20 minutes saying, on one hand this, but on the other hand that, you'd find this a very tedious talk indeed. And so, ladies and gentlemen and folks, I present to you the hoodie of truth. <laughs> <laughs> when the hoodie is down, you will hear the standard sort of run-of-the-mill things you'll hear at any conference. For example, Swift is a great language for first-time programmers. But no, when I raise this powerful hoodie, the truth comes out. Swift is actually pretty darn hard, and its baffling error messages do not help. Hoodie down. Scrum is a great way to deliver large products in an efficient way. Well, let's have a look. Hood up. Pure Scrum often saps morale. So most teams use Scrum but. Scrum but we don't do stand up. Scrum but we don't use retros. Hoodie down. Brexit's a terrible idea. <laughs> Hoodie up. It's a terrible idea. <laughs> so what does the hoodie of truth make of Swift? Well, Swift has a dazzling array of features we can use to really screw up our code in all manner of ways. So why use one when you can use them all? In fact, sometimes it's easier to learn what's right by seeing what's wrong. So in this talk, in the fastest I can possibly do it, we'll look at four things. Number one, protocols. Number two, inheritance. Number three, crashing. And number four, coding your UI. Starting with protocols. Now, protocols don't get me wrong there. They're really flexible. We can use them for composition and so forth. But in 2015, at Dub Dub in the infamous Krusty talk, Apple said, start with a protocol. <coughs> Why? <laughs> Why? Trying to design abstractions ahead of time inevitably results in a rat's nest of things you might not actually need in the future. We've had Yagni, you ain't gonna need it, for 20 years now. It means don't try to plan ahead. There's a good chance you'll be wrong. Instead, 
Start with a concrete type, so that you can understand and comprehend and use today in practical ways. And when some middle manager comes along and says, I want some random half-baked feature implemented, which never happens, of course, fine. Going from a fixed type up to a protocol, that's pretty easy to do. But if you planned ahead and made protocols galore, you're basically gambling your abstractions were the correct abstractions. And there's performance. If you're not careful, protocols will sap your performance. For example, we're familiar with the idea of arrays. I could read index number one in an array, index number four in an array. And we understand, as developers, this is a linear time operation, 01. The more we add, doesn't matter, just as fast. You can get from A to B by multiplying the size by the index. Easy. But what if we had an array of differently sized items, like strings, for example? Now saying array index 4 has to count from 0, 1, 2, 3 to get to 4. It's much, much slower. We have an ON operation. Now, if all our arrays were ON, all our apps would be disaster areas. So there's a problem here. Let's look at some code. Here's a struct person. Here's a property, the age integer. And here is an array of two of those people. This is a struct. The age integer is a struct, and the array itself, that's a struct too. Structs all over the place. This should be lightning fast allocations directly on the stack. We can visualize this as an array of little squares in memory as our people. Now let's bring in some protocols. Here is an identifiable protocol. Does nothing at all. I'll make person conform to that and use that for our array as well. Now we can see the code hasn't changed. But from Swift's perspective, any kind of identifiable thing could be in there. Different sized items. Now, it seems like we're going back to ON, which would be a disaster, like I said. We can't allow that. So Swift's solution is kick all your objects onto the heap, which means a load more allocations, a load more locks for each of those allocations. And then add pointers called containers in the original array that point from there into your heap. So you'll get an allocation for every single one of your objects plus the lock behind it. But there's more. Here's our array again. Let's loop over every item and call a method in every single one. Greet. Fine. Now, at runtime, Swift has no idea what each object is. So it'll say, OK, you, what do you mean by greet? Well, I mean this greet here. And you, what do you mean? Well, I mean this other greet. And the third object, I mean this third greet, and so forth. This is what we call, in computing science, Dynamic dispatch. At runtime, Swift has to figure out exactly what each method call means. It can't know at compile time. This is very, very slow. In comparison, if we switch from a protocol to a concrete type, it's a very different story. So if we look at our code exactly and understand every one of those is exactly the same greet method at compile time and put that directly in there, it can do static dispatch. Write it directly there, no work at runtime. Even better, it can inline the function, destroying it entirely. It's super, super fast. Here is a function that accepts any kind of thing as long as it conforms to my protocol and prints out a name property. Here's a very similar thing using generics. But the second one is significantly faster because at compile time, so if we can look at that code and see exactly how it's being used and then perform specialization, it could generate different copies of the same function as needed. It could say, here's the general greet, but here's one for people, here's one for users, here's one for strings, and so forth. And it could generate as many as it needs to make your code optimized, with each one of these functions being fully optimized for the type it's called with. Now, I say could as a trade-off between binary size and performance and so forth, but it's still possible, given the compiler the choices. These two things both take a my protocol. And the second one still gives you all the benefits of protocols. But now, by knowing this ahead of time, you're letting Swift do more work on your behalf, while still getting all the great flexibility and composition and pop from protocols. So if you aren't careful, and of course you are careful, you end up with protocols that force you down dynamic dispatch. Don't let the compiler specialize the code and add all those extra allocations for the containers. Don't do that. Inheritance. This is like a fundamental OOP concept, right? We can build powerful types by building them together and adding things. Yeah, it's really reusable. Well, <laughs> inheritance nearly always leads to far too much cruft. Properties and methods you do not use and do not want. You get extremely tight coupling you cannot replace later on. Plus, the actual reusability you get is fairly limited. 
Here's a great quote here by Joe Armstrong, one of the inventors of Erlang. The problem with object-oriented languages is they've got all this implicit environment they carry around with them. You wanted a banana, but what you got was a gorilla holding the banana and the entire jungle. <laughs> and UIKit has its fair share of these gorillas. We know that, for example, UIView has a background color property. Of course it does, right? UI label inherits from UIView, so it has a background color property. UI button has a background color property. UI stack view mysteriously has a background color property which would be a huge surprise to anyone who's read the Apple documentation, which says it's a non-rendering subclass of UIView. Properties like background color have no effect. They do nothing. But with inheritance, you haven't got a choice. When you add a new thing, it gets everything from all the parent classes, which inevitably has one ending. Things you don't want or don't need. <laughs> then there's the coupling. Coupling, we all know, is a measure of how interconnected code is. And tightly coupled code is code where information flows in every direction, where everything relies on everything else, where pulling out one bit of code means that the whole house of cards falls to pieces. You want to try and break that out, because inheritance is, by very nature, totally tied up the stack. You cannot pull out class A, because B, C, D, and E will all fall to pieces. Now, I am not saying stop subclassing UI view controller. We're kind of stuck with that. Uh, we like throwing things in over time. But don't follow Apple's example here of throwing everything in there. It's a terrible place for functionality. Instead, find ways to break up your stuff. And one solution is protocols. Now, you might think, wait a minute. He just said, hate protocol. Protocol's bad. Everything else good, right? Not quite. Don't start with a protocol. If you want to move on to them with refactoring later on, Go for it, fill your boots. But it's refactoring a bad situation, taking a flat hierarchy that you have and saying, let's go for protocols instead, splitting things up by functionality and combining them with extensions. Almost 20 years ago, Martin Fowler coined the rule of three to try and make you think about, sure, writing code once, that's OK. Duplicating it once, that's OK. Having a third copy, now's the time you want to refactor. And it, this has been around for 20 years now. It's taught a standard OOO. And there's Sandy Metz, who spoke at RailsConf four years ago, saying that actually duplication is far cheaper than making the wrong abstraction. So by all means, duplicate all you want to. And when you're ready, start breaking it up into protocols. But only when you're ready. And even then, I have some advice to you to help you squeeze your protocols as small as possible. Number one. Use extension points with intent. Adding the method definition in protocols matters. It's a choice you make that clarifies what you mean. For example, this is a greetable protocol with one method called greet. Here's an extension to that, filling in greet with hello as a default. Here's a type called user that conforms to greetable with its own implementation of greet, saying what's up. And here's an instance of that called Paul, and I'm calling paul.greet. This code will print what's up. But if I take out that method from the protocol and do nothing else, that code will now print hello. That one small change, by making an extension point or not, makes a huge difference. When you have it in the protocol, you are telling yourself, telling your colleagues, telling yourself in a year's time, more importantly, I want conforming types to be able to override this method. It's my intent that this happens. But not having in there what you're saying is, I prefer my default implementation to be used unless they explicitly ask for otherwise. Option two, apply your constraints as tightly as possible. Really squeeze them. For example, here is a generic extension to all users, adding an authenticate method. That's fine. Then add a different one for a subset of those people. If you're a top secret user, then constrain this thing. And Swift will resolve these beautifully for you by always choosing the most constrained option for any type. For example, a generic all users authenticate will be chosen by default. A more constrained version will be preferred for top secret users, and even more constrained if you are a top secret Apple staff. It'll resolve them by most constrained first. So please squeeze your protocols. And third, design your types naturally. I see code like this all the time. An identifiable protocol with a generic ID integer being attached to it. We've got this person here that conforms to it. Fine, you know, it works. But what is ID? Is ID something like a, a monotonically increasing integer? Is it the social security number? Is it something else? We don't really know. Is it private or not? 
A better idea is say, rather than having ID int, tell your protocol, I don't mind what conforming types have. I don't care what they call it. It can be any kind of type, but it have to have something that's an ID. And now I can say for my person, it's a social security number, something clearly very private, want to keep secret to themselves, and link that back to the protocol with an ID key like that. And it means that other conforming types, for example, a book can be identifiable. It's an ISBN it uses, and it's a string, not an integer. So you can use what you like based on what conforms to your individual structs, rather than letting them conform to some random protocol ID. And when you want to use it, fine, just use KeyPass to read it back in a natural, easy way. If you're going to constrain stuff, by the way, last little tip, constrain the protocol, please. It's so important. And even provide a default type for Swift to give it a head start. Now, this code here uses key paths, uses generics, uses associated types. That's my idea of powerful Swift. <laughs> Crashing. Now, surely, software development 101, good code never crashes. Should never crash. Should handle itself gracefully no matter what it comes up against. Let's have a think what the hoodie of truth says. Eh. Good code should crash as often as you like. Do so loudly, make it crash, just do it early and do it loudly. Swift even gives you a function call to make your code crash. It's called assert. Assert whatever the heck you like. If that thing returns false, your code will crash. That might sound terribly dangerous, but the magic is it only crashes when you've pushed from Xcode. All those assertions go away in App Store builds. So you know for sure users won't get hit by it. So assert what you like. Assert that there are five users being passed into your method. Assert that some slow code returns true. That slow code will not be run on App Store releases. So go ahead and do as much as you want. Sprinkle assertions all throughout your code. If you do nothing else after today, double the number of assertions in your code, unless you have zero, in which case, let's talk afterwards. <laughs> then it's precondition. This is really similar to assert. Go ahead and do precondition some code. If that's false, your code will crash, just like assert, except now, it'll crash for users as well. It won't get compiled out of App Store releases, which might sound bad, but the Swift standard library uses precondition 246 times. You are all using precondition already, whether you like it or not. Things like calling remove last on an empty collection, things like reversing ranges or dividing by zero or reading out array ranges, these are all using precondition. So if they think it's normal to have this functionality, you should be doing it as well. And then my personal favorite, fatal error. This will crash your code regardless. No test. It just crashes your code no matter what. I love it. But the magic is, you look at the standard library source code, it returns a never. A compiler intrinsic making it clear, this thing will never come back. It will always crash. And so you can use it when any functionality is being used that you think this shouldn't be the case. For example, dequeuing table view cells, getting things from storyboards like view controllers, reading the app bundle. There is no sensible way of saying, I could not find my view controller, right? You can't recover from that. Just bail out. Similarly, for all your force unwraps, I have hand typed this string. It's either right or it's wrong. That code needs to crash if I've got it wrong. Don't try and mask it with an error message or a log. Get out of there as fast as you can loading an image from your bundle or regular expressions. Again, it's right or it's wrong. You cannot show an error saying, whoops, the coder made a mistake here. You crash and fix it. It's a logic error. And if you use JP's uh, amazing SwiftLint tool, which I'm sure you all do, I hope you all do, and you don't want to add force and wraps and stuff everywhere, fine, fill your boots. Extensions like this work wonders. This adds a UI kind of color convenience initializer, which lets you force unwrap just once in your place to ensure all your UI colors exist. And the same exists for, of course, UI image. But the magic is, the reason it's great is it uses a Swift's static string, a string that cannot use string interpolation. So you cannot use this thing by accident on string interpolated values. Or if you're using try catch stuff, something like this. Here's one for an NS regular expression. Again, it's either right or it's wrong. Again, static string, and it will bail out if it's bad. Assertions should be absolutely everywhere, preconditions as appropriate, fatal error when needed. And finally, coding your UI. This is a pretty big topic. <laughs> I'm out of time, quite frankly. But <laughs> if you want to come and buy me a beer later on, I'll let you borrow the hoodie of truth. <laughs> and to wrap up, I want to say one thing, and this is honestly putting all jokes to one side. Uh, You've got to go back and work in a great team all being well. Please be compassionate developers. Listen to advice from your colleagues and find sensible agreement. Thank you very much.